On a daily basis, the general staff of the armed forces of Ukraine provides figures for Russia's military losses in Ukraine's war. More than 19,000 losses in personnel, thousands in units of equipment. There are also organizations that keep an independent count. For example, according to Oryx, a bloc which keeps count of losses in the military conflicts, Russia has lost about 16% of its entire tank inventory. We took some examples and tried to figure out exactly what does it state for. For example, the T-72B tank. According to many open sources, the Russian army has a total of 650 tanks of this type in service. According to experts, around 60-70% of all vehicles that are in service stayed in combat-ready condition. Let us take the figure of 65%. 65% of these vehicles is about 623, taken to the high side. At least 129 of these tanks were captured or destroyed in Ukraine. In such a way, we can calculate that the Russian ground forces lost at least 30% of the combat-ready T-72B tanks in Ukraine. The BM-21 Grad multiple launcher rocket system is the most mass-produced rocket artillery vehicle. There are 550 vehicles in service with the Russian ground forces. Of these, 358 are combat ready. At least 40 vehicles of this type has been lost, which is 11%. It is worth taking account that the artillery units are not stationed on the front lines, but fire under the cover of forward troop formations. Among the infantry fighting vehicles, it is worth mentioning the most common and widely used BMP-2. There are 3,000 of them in service. About 1,950 are combat ready and at least 189, which is about 10%, have been lost over six weeks of hostilities in Ukraine. Should the enemy be underestimated? Even now, the Russian Federation has plenty to continue fighting against Ukraine. Russia has also changed its tactics. A new head, Colonel General Alexander Dvornikov, has been appointed. The record of his crimes is well known from Syria. According to experts, his tactics included the use of shelling, bombardment, torture and even chemical weapon. The main thing is not the tragic events in Ukraine. Many people say that the US is ready to fight Russia to the last Ukrainian. In fact, it is true. Putin said this phrase during a joint press conference with the self-proclaimed president of Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko. They met at the Vostochny Cosmodrome in the Amur region to give an update on the war in Ukraine. Today we will talk to our guest about how seriously we should take the dictator's words. Back to studio. Now I remind for our audience that we are now in our studio to discuss the latest developments. This is UA English broadcast and our main topic today and for the last 49 days of the Russian invasion is how to stop the war, how to stop the Russian army. And uh, this topic we we just going to discuss with our special guest. And this is Captain Gary Tabach uh, from United States Navy captain. Uh, Mr. Tabach served as chief of staff uh, of the NATO military liaison mission in Moscow since 2011. Uh, and he uh, was... Um, he conducted liaison between NATO's military committee and the Minister of Defense of the Russian Federation. So my greetings to you, Mr. Gary. Hi, Ukraine. Hello. 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 I, I hear my echo. Uh, we have a couple technical issues, Mr. Gary. Uh, do you hear us? Yes, I hear you very well. Thank you. Uh, that's great. Sometimes we, uh, we might have some of the issues. Just as right now, as I see now, the connection has been lost for a second, and we're again here. Um, Mr. Tabak, let's go with our, uh, with our discussion. So our main topic is uh, the real capability of the Russian Federation uh, in Ukraine. We know that every day, uh, general staff of the armed forces of Ukraine updates the information about the real losses uh, that uh, Russian army suffers in, uh, in, tech, in technic, in, uh, uh, in a death range, and uh, uh, overall in uh, rocket launchers. In so 
The question to you is how long Russian Federation is capable to fight in Ukraine? Well, uh, as a, as a, uh, firstly, I'm a retired U.S. Navy captain, and uh, I can say that uh, those kind of predictions in the war are not really reliable. Things can change very, very quickly. One of the worst things that you can do is that you can underestimate your enemy or overestimate your own uh, uh, victories. And you should never lie in war. The reason that the Israelis were able to beat the Arabs so many times is because Arabs were lying and Israelis were telling the truth. And this is why it is so important in our military when officers have to be absolutely truthful with whatever is going on, whether they made a mistake, whether they didn't, they have to admit it and stand by it. Uh, Russians are definitely get, uh, you know, uh, getting beaten by the Ukrainian forces and uh, definitely um, uh, they're overestimated uh, their capabilities and underestimated the Ukrainian. But it was also underestimated due to our uh, own uh, uh, intelligence and our own United States military. For example, the uh, chief of the general staff, General Milley, right before the war said that the Ukraine will collapse within 72 hours. And then uh, President Biden offered asylum to President uh, Zelensky. President Zelensky told me to, told him to, you know, follow the Russian ship and he needs uh, weapons, not a taxi. And uh, now uh, we can see what kind of um, fight, fierce fight Ukraine put up and how well they're doing it. <clears throat> of course, Ukrainians are also suffering huge losses because they don't have the right equipment. They don't have the right instruments to repel this uh, 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 the enemy that is much, much larger and much crueler than the uncivilized, you could say, uh, compared to the Ukrainian forces. So now General Milley is saying that this is going to be a very, very long war. So we have to ask ourselves a question. Where does General Milley get that information? Is he comes up with it himself, that he changes it so drastically? Is that our intelligence that not doing a good job that we spend on billions of dollars on our 17 different intelligence agencies that are feeding him different information? Or is he playing politics? He adjusted to whatever the politicians today in the White House want him to say. I tend to believe the later one. So, the, and, the, uh, and that is a problem. Then the commander, we lose the trust in our commander, in the guy who is in charge of our, our armed forces, the military leader, because he, he is basically is playing politics, which he should stay out of and probably should have retired after our Afghanistan. military leader is here. He is still in Kiev. This is Mr. President Zelensky. And uh, we are proud of him, I would say, uh, really. And um, uh, I just want to uh, clarify, uh, excuse me, the, the in interrupting you, but just one, m m one little nuance I want to uh, point out in what you've just said, the m probable miscalculation. The, so the probable miscalculation w was uh, in, uh, in Russia, Russia did, the, did miscalculate it. Probably some of the uh, Western analytics and uh, politicians uh, do miscalculate it. So, uh, definitely. Definitely, yeah. But what what is the uh, how how could we make the um, the uh, how can we judge this miscalculation right now? And what is our lesson that we could take from it? Uh, talking about the capabilities of the Russian army and its possible plan. Just yesterday, Mr. Putin uh, stated that um, allegedly United States is going to wage a war against Russia till the last Ukrainian. What does it mean? What does it say about the plans of Russian Federation? Who said that? I'm sorry. Uh, the president of the aggressor state, I mean, the president of the oh. Russian Federation, Vladimir Vladimirovich well, Putin. Yeah, well, you know, the politicians, you should uh, take every statement that they say with a grain of salt, because just recently he said that he was going to take Kiev, that they're going to change the, uh, uh, the leadership in Ukraine, that they're going to demilitarize Ukraine, they're going to denationalize Ukraine. He was saying a lot of things, but none of it exists. That's his wish. 
but his wish it does not necessarily mean that Ukrainians agree with it or the rest of the world agrees with it. Again, I think that today the entire world is watching Ukraine. The entire world is trying, is is probably surprised that the 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 fight that the Ukrainians put up, the stamina that your president has, that people didn't expect it, and the skill with which your armed forces are fighting off the Russians. Unfortunately, it's taking for the West too long too long to supply and to help and to support Ukraine with it. Uh, uh, but hopefully they will get the right tools, Ukrainians will get the right tools, and then they will be able to conduct. With recent operations that Ukraine conducted, especially in Mariupol, I think that 300 Spartans will have to take the second prize. The operations that were, were conducted in Bel Belgorod by uh, exploding and destroying the fuel dump, uh, dumps, and by now uh, capture of Medvedchuk, this is kind of comparing to Israeli operations. Israeli, you know, you're in competition with the Israelis pulling off such things. So I think that uh, uh, everybody is realizing, I mean, people, not maybe not necessarily politicians, but most of the people you realize- verify. Uh, Mr. Gary, excuse me, we still cannot verify that uh, this was uh, some of them were Ukrainian, like the capture of Medvedchuk. It's definitely Ukrainian operation. But talking about fuel tanks or what what, what else was uh, shot or what else was exploded in Belgorod, uh, to my mind, it's still uh, still uh, not cl clear who did this. Ukrainian army or uh, Russian army itself, because it's, it surely could be uh, just a provocation, isn't it? Well. Well, yeah, I don't see how you can provoke what a provocation would be. You're fighting the enemy and you're hitting them where it hurts. I was just, if you just let me finish my thoughts, it, I'm saying that you're competing with Israelis. Israelis also always say we cannot confirm nor deny what we're doing. If that just happens, just like a derailed trains in Belarus. Who did that? Belarusian partisans or or it was just an accident? You know, all these things just don't happen. But somebody works very, very hard in the military on it and today the whole world is very very impressed with the way ukrainians are fighting for their freedom fighting for their independence and showing the love for their own country most more ukrainians now are returning back to ukraine uh i mean mostly women and children uh than leaving ukraine today that means it shows to the whole world the love for ukraine they have and uh fearlessness that they're willing to go back to the war zone to help their troops, to help their families, to fight uh, this evil. And it is evil, what's going on. And unfortunately, until the West realizes it, that, uh, that until we break the neck of that evil, he's gonna continue and he's gonna fight and he's gonna continue and kill and murder innocent people, destroy, uh, destroy uh, infrastructure and um, commit all kinds of war crimes. So the sooner the West engages in it and provides Ukraine with the right instruments to do that, uh, the, the sooner this war will end. But, um, but it will only end when the devil evil will uh, be uh, destroyed. There is sheep and there are wolves. Wolves eat sheep. And uh, sheep will never be able to convince a wolf to, to stop doing this. The only one that can convince Wolf to stop doing it is somebody that looks like Wolf, but more aggressive than Wolf. And that's uh, that's the dog that guards the sheep. Uh, so uh, this, is what I, this is where we are right now, but Ukraine needs all the help they can get now, quickly, supply them with the right tools. So yeah, thanks for this opinion. Uh, I mean, the, you, you, probably we need to become uh, even stronger and even more aggressive than Wolf. Uh, that is, uh, talking about this, uh, we a couple of days ago there was a report. Uh, BBC reported that um, supposedly uh, the Colonel uh, General Alexander Dvornikov was appointed a commander of the. Uh, this military campaign they call a special operation in Ukraine. So he will be in charge of commander, commanding the uh, war and, uh, uh, in Ukraine. And um, also, uh, just, just the, the day after uh, these, uh, uh, this report uh, was up, we 
we have seen the report from the Mariupol where um, our military uh, stated that the chemical attack was conducted against our units. So uh, we still cannot ver verify it, it independently uh, because it's just impossible to ver verify some substances in Mariupol. There are no more any uh, laboratories that can conduct the, uh, the independent uh, analysis of the substance. So, but it's just clear after, after our military um, report that they, um, that, that they feel themselves as after the chemical attack. And uh, the question is uh, that what, what, this, uh, what this change of the com command in Ukraine, Russian, of the Russian forces uh, attacking Ukraine uh, means and uh, what it leads about, does it, does it mean that uh, there will be more chemical attacks uh, and other such war criminal activity? Well, uh uh, General Dvornikov is definitely a thug and a criminal. He's a bloody murderer, and he showed that before, although I think all of the generals, Russian generals who are involved in this campaign are thugs and murderers, cold-blooded murderers. They showed that, and Dvornikov was in charge of that in Aleppo in uh, Syria. So he has done that before. And uh, there is a history of such things. So I do not, uh, on one hand, it's, of course, it's very sad that the general and the commanders and officers behave in such a way, uh, uh, violating Geneva Convention rules by attacking civilians and using weapons of mass destruction. On the other hand, usually those people militarily are not talented. They don't care for human life. They make mistakes. Uh, they... Um, uh, uh, military mistakes, and they're easier to fight in that sense. Unfortunately, too much blood gets spilled with them. On the other hand, um, the chemical attack, uh, allegedly a chemical attack in Mariupol, again, that has to be checked. That has to be verified. There are several ways of verifying those things. I do know a little bit about it because I actually dealt with it in the Defense Threat Reduction Agency when I was a mission commander there. And uh, I can tell that um, uh, it has to be verified. There is a ways that you two sides have to let the independent uh, teams in or get the patients out and see what they were poisoned with. But so far, reports also, uh, we have to realize that there, war is lies. People lie on both sides. They lie, they exaggerate, and um, uh, we have to verify it because... In, to my knowledge, to my knowledge, now again, I'm not, I'm not stating that this is the way it is, but they, if uh, Zarin, the, the chemical weapon that was used there, then uh, there were only, the claim is there were only two people that got injured, were not even killed. So it's, it's, um, it's it, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't look like there was a chemical attack. There could have been an incident or there could have been an accident of some sort. Uh, but to prove that it was a chemical attack when we claim that there are only two people that were injured by it and we don't have those two people to check their blood and check what, what kind of substance was used, then it's going to be very, very difficult to prove it. Although I would not uh, doubt that the Russians uh, and the Russian uh, leadership, so-called, will, uh, will not resort. They will they will they could use a chemical weapon as they've done it before uh, or any other weapon of mass destruction. It is all depends on us, how we will react to it, how our leadership will react to it. If we're going to ignore or move the red line as we did previously, it's one thing. If we're going to strike um, again with the tomahawks, how we did it in, in Syria, you know, it's dependent on our administration. Uh, on, uh, under Obama administration, we moved the red line. Under Trump administration, we bombed Syrian uh, uh, chemical weapons storages, which were part of the Russian base, and the Russians didn't do anything. They saw that the strength and the, and the commitment that we had to punish the ones that use such things. So we will see. We will see how we will re what it is and how the West will react to it. If we will continue to be sheep threatened by that wolf and not you know, and constantly back off and constantly thinking that we can 
negotiate with him or convince him of something, then of course he takes it as a weakness on our part and continues to commit crimes, uh, uh, crimes uh, against him humanity. Uh, if we show aggression and we show more strength to him and tell him that we're not afraid of him, we're not afraid of his weapons of mass destruction, and if he's going to behave like that, we're going to kill him. Then I think the reaction will be different. Unfortunately, I think the all KGB thugs and all that Putin is part of it, they only understand strength and they only respect the ones that are stronger than they are or more aggressive than they are, that will not hesitate to punish him and punish him hard. So, uh, well, uh, unfortunately, our broadcast is limited in time, and I just uh, just want to, to uh, I would I would like to somehow summarize what is what 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 been said uh, with these uh, 17 or 15 minutes, just uh, very briefly ans uh, answering the question of how to stop Putin. Uh, should we, for example, get more warfare, or, or, or what? What could stop him? It's uh, it's uh, in a very briefly uh, to say to stop him. If you want to stop him, you kill him. That's how you stop him. But that's very briefly. I think what it is is that uh, uh, Ukraine should in, Ukraine should engage and should prepare itself for a big fight ahead of them. There should be a big battle ahead of Ukraine, they should be prepared. And it depends on uh, uh, on the allies that uh, will support today. We see that uh, Great Britain, uh, Boris Johnson takes a lead. Unfortunately, United States is not taking a lead in it. Boris, Great Britain takes a lead on, on this, on the Western uh, uh, world, Western society to support Ukraine. And uh, we all have to back off again. Today, it's a World War III. Don't be fooled by anybody who's telling you that it's limited operation or it's, uh, uh, or it's a hybrid war. No, it's a full-scale World War III where Russia fights against the whole world. Unfortunately, to this point, it's only Ukraine that fights for the entire world, for the whole world. So the, the entire world should engage soon, and it should have, should have been engaged before, but Unfortunately, we didn't. So I hope it will happen soon that Ukraine will be given weapons, intelligence, and everything they need, land lease from the United States as soon as it can, so they're prepared. Because right now, there is a race against time. There is a race between Ukrainian forces getting geared up and getting prepared for an attack, and the Russian forces are rallying and maneuvering and regrouping to attack Ukraine one more time. Uh, thank you very much for your opinion here in our studio. Uh, and uh, we've just had here... Slava uh, Ukraini! We've just had here uh, uh, in our studio uh, a retired captain of the uh, United States Navy, Gary Tabach. And uh, I'm, again, just to remind uh, to our studio, uh, we were talking about uh, what can possibly stop Russia uh, and in this war and uh, we've just we've just heard one of the opinions uh, and thank you very much for being with us here uh, I'm saying to our audience uh, this was Nick Starkov and see you tomorrow